Guys, we have come from Texarkana all the way through some of Arkansas into Oklahoma past Broken Bow and we are on Hanobi Creek Scenic Route. It's hot. I'm not going to be getting out a whole bunch, so you're going to get a lot of dash cam. Welcome to Outdoors for Adventure. In this video, we are exploring the Hanobia Wildlife Management Area. This is a Hanaba Creek scenic route that's on Onyx Off-Road. You can go to OutdoorsOklahoma.com licensing to get a three-day permit to explore these areas. The fee is $20. You can get a year permit for $100. From what I understand, you do need this permit to enter the areas. Hanobia Creek WMA covers 78,997.94 acres in southeast Oklahoma, located north off Highway 3, 7 and east off Highway 271, northeast of Antlers and east of Highway 259 and north of Highway 4. It's north and east of Smithville. Hanobia Creek WMA is a mixture of pine and hardwood forest. Loblolly pine plantations of various age classes predominate the majority of WMA. Interspersed within the pine plantations are hardwood benches and streamside management zones dominated by oaks and hickories. The land within Hanobi Creek and Three Rivers WMA is owned by Weyhauser Company and requires annual land access permit. Uh, this is $40 for all residents and non-residents who hunt and fish on the WMAs. Non-residents are required to purchase $85 annual permit with no exceptions. Now, at first I thought that was just if you were hunting and fishing, but from my understanding it is to access the property. Now, I did find a three-day, $20 permit, and I will put a link to that page in the description of this video. While exploring this area, we did see quite a bit of wildlife and several deer. This route can be quite muddy if it's been raining. time we were here everything was dry even some of the creeks were dry we did find some running water and a few puddles while dry expect extreme dust especially if you're following somebody this area is known for folklore of bigfoot such as the hanoba siege So why not cover a little bit about what this is? This article comes from the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, or BFRO for short. In mid-January of 20, the first message received by the BFRO from the uncle of the Hanobi family. Too many incidents to mention here. Please have someone contact us. This is not a hoax. My brother is afraid for his family. This creature is getting bolder every time it returns. This thing is huge, walks upright, and smells like a musky, urine, burnt hair type odor. He repeatedly comes back in the early morning hours after midnight and harasses them until just before dawn. It has, on more than one occasion, tried to enter their home. We don't know where to turn. Everyone thinks we are crazy when we mention it. Please, 
We don't know what to do, but I do know that something needs to be done. There are stories we could tell that would make the hair stand on your neck. The message went on to explain that the family was having problems over the past two years with one or more nuisance animals that were prowling around outside the home at night. The animals were stealing deer meat from an outside shed. The situation had escalated when the animals tried to get into the home. At one point, the father went outside to confront the animal. He got a good look at one and took a shot out what he claimed was a Bigfoot running back to the woods. We contacted the family after receiving the report. The man we spoke with first was the brother of the father of the family. He insisted that they were not kidding around. At least one Bigfoot was coming around the homestead almost every night. It was coming onto the porch, messing with a window, wiggling the doorknob as if it wanted to get in to the house and even stealing deer meat out of a freezer that was kept in an open-sided outbuilding. Whatever it was wasn't alone. The family could hear chattering and screaming from the hills when the prowlers were near the home. The wife was too fearful to remain in the house. She and the kids were relocated temporarily. While the men armed themselves with assault rifles and prepared to defend the homestead against the nightly prowlers. On the night before the first message was received, the father fired at one of the animals and thought he may have hit it. The following morning, he found a substantial trail of blood in the yard and thought it was from the animal he shot. One of the BFRO investigators, an airline pilot from Ohio, offered to visit the scene to hopefully collect some of the blood that was left in the wake of the previous night shooting. Another BFRO investigator made contact with the residents by phone and began updating other BFRO members via email. I finally spoke with the shooter last night. When I spoke with him directly, I got the facts straight about the situation at the house with the blood. The shooter is named Tim. His brother, the one who originally contacted us, is named Michael. Tim says the Bigfoot ran after he shot it, but then he and his brother could hear it and others on the hillside for several hours after the shooting. That suggests to me that he didn't even wound it and all the blood is from the deer. Miles and Roger will be there in a few hours to, and see this all for themselves and thoroughly look over the area. They will be armed. Roger's father, a very skilled 72-year-old bear hunter, will remain on the property, possibly for a few days. Tim says he doesn't care what we do there, but if the animal comes back to the house and scratches at the window again, he will go out and try to kill it. He's had to send his kids to stay with relatives, and he and his wife are clearly terrified. The volunteer, Roger Roberts, is a well-respected veteran private investigator in Oklahoma. He was in military intelligence in Vietnam, then a police officer for many years in Oklahoma before becoming a private investigator. He is on a first-name basis with law enforcement off officials throughout Oklahoma and is very familiar with every jurisdiction. Both Miles and I were very impressed by him after speaking with him at length on the phone. Roger chuckled when I said we were wondering why Tim hadn't called the police about this. Roger said there are hardly any sheriffs in this area because there's a lot of weed growing in southern Oklahoma and the federal government routinely does unannounced sweeps and arrests crooked deputies. The backwoods people do not talk to police if they can help it. Roger said this mentality is the norm of, for southeastern Oklahoma, firmly rooted over generations. Tim wants us to take care of the problem. He doesn't want the Bigfoot coming back to his house anymore, and he doesn't care what it takes to make it stop. He will not move and not hold back from shooting at it if it returns. I told him that we we're sending some people by who will help him figure out what should be done. I said the bear hunter will shoot if there's no other way to handle it, but in any case, to let us handle it. There may be no other way to handle it because tranquilizing it would be 
as we learned last year, basically impossible to arrange, especially if it needs to be done within a few weeks. The presence of more people with rifles at the location will best deter the animal, whatever it is, while this situation being assessed and we're recording audio and video there. We have always known that in the natural course of things, there would someday be an overly aggressive Bigfoot that would get itself killed by someone protecting his family property. This may be the one, inevitably, Matt. A, a day later, more was added. Miles and Roger and Roger's father are at the location and setting up. I spoke with Tim's wife briefly. She reiterated how frightened they were of this thing and described some of the incidents. Far from jumping to conclusions, she said that her and her husband had denied the whole thing to themselves for a few years. It wasn't until after the deer meet, three complete quarter deer had all disappeared from the large chest freezer in the outdoor shed that the intruder started trying to get in the house at night. It didn't just scratch at the window, she said. It had pulled off parts of the window and was getting bolder in its attempt to get into the house. The recent deer kill found outside had not been shot. One of its legs was violently twisted and broken. It had clearly been carried, not dragged, to the spot where it was found. The most interesting thing was how the predator pulled out the intro organs. The belly of the deer had not been opened. The opening was up between the neck and the ribcage. The predator made a hole large enough to stick its arm in and apparently reached down from above the ribcage and pulled out the organs. Yuck. Miles and Rogers are surely photographing all of this right now. There is no doubt in the lady's mind on the main question. She's adamant that it is not a bear. The loud vocalizations, tree thrashing, chittering, and whistling outside the house at night are the most noticeable reoccurring things. There was considerably more noise during the night the deer was killed. Note that the vocalization and tree thrashing aspects were not present at either the South Carolina locations or the Kentucky locations. I expect our three guys will be at least hear something tonight. Matt. Twelve hours later, more details. I was on the phone with the people at the house last night for a few hours. I was asking questions and listening to what was happening. Things got very hectic at one point. These guys were actually shooting from the porch while I was on the phone. I figured it would be best to let them go at that point and said I'd talk to them later. I don't know as yet all the highlights of what happened. All I know is that I heard last night on the phone and what I heard from Tim and Michael this morning. I haven't heard from Miles and Rogers yet today, but they will report on what happened and what they brought back with them, if anything. As of this morning, they did not have a body, according to Tim and Michael. This morning, Miles and Rogers went to check out a cave in the area where one had been seen in during the day, according to another local witness who came to speak with Miles and Rogers yesterday. Apparently, they all saw a few Bigfoots last night near the property. I don't know how much, if anything, was gotten on tape. I do know that it was pouring rain all night last night which complicated things greatly, especially with the recording equipment. I assume they are on their whole way home. I'll try to call Roger in a few minutes. From my conversation yesterday and early this morning with the residents, we think we figured out what is so different about this situation. The underlying cause seemed to be that lots and lots of deer congregate on Tim's property. He's got 30 acres in the mountains and he plants Australian snow peas all over the property, especially near the house because deer go crazy for them this time of year. People plant these plants specifically to attract deer. It makes it easier to hunt. Many deer come to feed on his property. There's a deer overpopulation problem in the area to start with, so his property is apparently an active magnet for deer. 
There are so many deer that he doesn't even have to get off his porch to go hunting. He bags lots of deer on his own property and has been doing it for years now. He and Michael said that on some occasions the deer carcasses were snatched away by something. We didn't get into details about each of those incidents, but some of those incidents involved frozen quartered venison being taken from a big freezer in an outside shed with no door. The freezer had no lock, but does have a very heavy lid that needs to be lifted. The frozen deer parts were all taken eventually. When there were none left, him and his wife started hearing the attempts of something trying to get into the window and loud hollering outside. A few times... Tim ran out after it, but it would always flee into the woods. The first time he got a good look at it was the night that he shot at it, a few nights ago. The most baffling thing for all of us was why these things weren't running away after being shot at. They'd pull back a bit into the trees. They'd move to a different part of the hillside and could be seen through the brush when the spotlight reflected on their, off their eyes. Michael told me on the phone last night that both he and Roger were seeing what Michael and Tim were describing in terms of the red eyes and other movement in the trees. Supposedly, a lot more happened after I got off the phone. Michael and Tim were trying to kill the animals. Apparently, there was more than one target at some point. I asked Robert on the phone if it was possible these guys are just freaked out and shooting our raccoons in the trees. Roger sounded very nervous and didn't want to talk much. He just replied, no, this is serious business. They've definitely got a problem here. I called back a while later and was only able to talk to Miles and Roger for a few seconds. Miles' last words about what was happening. It's pretty much shoot to kill at the moment. <laughs> this morning, I asked him if he ever spotlights deer at night from his porch. He does. Then we established that indeed most of the time when he's spotlighting the woods and shooting from his porch is when he's shooting at deer, not Bigfoot. So if the animals who aren't running away from the loud gunshots are some kind of predator, like Bigfoots, that's been in the area for a while, then those predators may have noticed that sometimes after those spotlighting gunshot incidents, a wounded deer would be struggling up the hill trying to get away and would be much easier to catch. Deer will always take off running when they hear gunshots, especially within 50 yards. That's how they know they weren't seeing deer's eyes. While the shooting was going on, the animals may have thought Tim and Michael were taking shots at deer as they usually do, and that's maybe why they aren't running. Tim sounded stunned when I explained the deer connection. He slurred out a long, steady, oh my God, as if it finally all made sense to him. The Bigfoots might be hanging around the property waiting to grab a wounded deer. I explained these predators may not understand that they are the intended targets. Now, because all they would see is a spotlight shining through the trees toward them, then a very loud bang from an assault rifle. The animals may be expecting to see wounded deer running toward them up the hill. They may have watched that pattern for years. It's possible they either don't realize that there are bullets whizzing by them, or they have gotten used to it. At the range, the shot is so loud you wouldn't hear a bullet hitting the trees next to you and they wouldn't see when the guns are pointing right at them because the spotlights would be in their eyes at the moment. It may appear to be business as usual with all the shooting going on. Matt. Oklahoma ranked ninth in the nation for Bigfoot sightings. Some sources say Oklahoma has more sightings per capita than anywhere else in the world. Over the last several decades, many reported sightings of Bigfoot have come with various descriptions of his stint. Witnesses claim that the beast emitted a foul odor comparable to that of a skunk. Others have reported tree trunks ripped from the ground or broken in half at heights too tall for a person to reach. Based on this information, it's estimated that Bigfoot averages around 6 to 9 feet tall. Its footprints have been rumored to measure as long as 20 inches. 
The first official recording of a footprint was collected by hunters near Bossburg, Washington, on October 15, 1958. The prints measured 20 inches long, 7 inches wide, with five toes clearly visible. These measurements would place Sasquatch at over 7 feet tall. To date, all of these are still considered to be some of the best examples of big footprints collected to date. Oklahoma State Representative Justice Humphrey put forth a plan in January of 2021 suggesting $25,000 for anyone who could bring a Sasquatch in. Apparently, the whole idea has gained incredible momentum in the days since with the state's tourism department planning a whole campaign around it. There are stories all over America about hairy, Sasquatch-like creatures lurking in forests and caves. But do people see them because they really exist? Or is it just an ancient myth that continues to live on today? There are still sightings made by credible people, which makes us wonder if maybe there is some truth to all of these tall tales. The question whether or not to believe stories of giant hairy men beasts roaming around our country is one that people often get heated about. And while seeing is believing, stories also offer entertainment and a sense of wonder at things we cannot explain. Which explains why so many people continue to hunt for elusive creatures like Sasquatch. But given how widespread sightings are, there must be something happening out there in America's remote forests and caves. Are these ancient myths continuing to live on? Maybe they're more than myths after all. Have you seen a Sasquatch? While we were on this trip, we did have a deer that saw us in advance and crossed the road in front of us off to the right side. It wasn't two seconds later that same deer come flying back across the road right in front of us off to the left side with fear in its eyes and its legs couldn't move fast enough to get it across the road. Was there a Sasquatch on that side of the road? Or could it possibly have been a bobcat? Maybe a mountain lion? We didn't stop to go see what scared that deer back across the road. But we could only wonder what that deer saw on that side of the road that it had to make a sharp turn and go back the way it came. We did see several deer on this trip. Luckily, we did catch a few of them in this video. The temperatures were warm enough this trip that we did have some issues with our action cameras overheating, but we did the best we could to capture the majority of this route. All of this route is on the north side of the main road. The stretch of the route that's on the south side of the road, we did not capture. The Jeep Grand Cherokee handled the whole route wonderfully. Even the rough parts we rode across in comfort. There was a couple sections that I used the off-road modes and put it in rock mode, gave us a little extra height to climb over some ruts and rocks. When this area is dry, the route's really not that hard at all. But if it rains, and if it's rained good, be prepared for very muddy sections and possibly getting stuck. But as I said, the Grand Cherokee did remarkable and during the whole trip, I averaged 17.5 miles to gallon, which is pretty good considering the gear I had on my roof. We did run across a few dispersed campsites, but the majority of those are going to be on the south side of the main road, and we didn't get any recordings of that area, so it'll be something that you get to experience firsthand on your own. We had geared the Grand Cherokee up with our set power refrigerator and we used the Vector power station to power that. And as we were driving, the Jeep would charge the Vector power station. This setup works really well for us. And on shorter trips, the set power 
is the fridge we choose on longer trips where we need more food or if we want to take ice cream we swap the set power out for the big ice cold dual zone both setups work amazingly onyx followed this route for us without issue Onyx has come a long way since it first came out and continues to upgrade its systems. If you haven't used Onyx, be sure to go check it out because you can use it for free and then upgrade if you like it. We hope you enjoyed this adventure as we checked out this area. We do realize it's a lot of cam footage, but it was so hot and I just did not get out and do a lot of video taping of the vehicle going across stuff but you can see from this video the road conditions and how they are while it is dry and if you pay attention to the road surfaces you can also tell and get a good idea of what it would be like if it was wet so if you haven't subscribed to our channel We'd appreciate it if you went ahead and went down and clicked that subscribe button. Click the bell so you get notifications of new videos and share with all your friends. We appreciate all the help that everyone gives us to keep the channel going, keep the adventures going, and to help us grow. Thank you very much.
another site to stop and see. It's down here off the side of the road. Very pretty. Not a lot of flowing water right now, it's so dry.
All right, one of the creeks that actually have water in it right now. A little bit. We have some fish over here. I don't know if y'all can see them or not. Another pool on in the back back there. 